The Christian Progress, a book by John Angel James, demeans a spiritual progress. This is of unspeakable importance. The question is not, what shall I do to be saved, but what shall I do to be sanctified? We've already said that means must be used, but what means? Number one, there must be a deep conviction of the necessity and importance of progress and an intense desire to attain it. The subject must lay hold of the mind and possess the heart. Will a man increase in knowledge, in wealth, in influence, who has no desire after it? What object ever was or can be obtained without a conviction of its value, or a wish to secure it? Is it not the desire that originates the effort, and will not exertion ever be in proportion to the intensity of desire? What prodigious and wonderful efforts have men put forth after an object upon which their hearts were set? Look at the tradesman. Oh, how he will toil, rising up early and sitting up late, and eating the bread of carefulness to increase his trade. Look at the student panting after knowledge. How will he consume his days and trim his midnight lamp to increase his scientific stores? Look at the hero. Brave in all the dangers of the field and the hardships of the campaign to increase his fame and to acquire glory, which is but the name vanity turned into an idol. Why? Why all this intense energy? Because they have a deep but mistaken sense of the importance of the object of pursuit and an absorbing and overheated desire to possess it. And on the contrary... Why is it that so many professing Christians do not make progress and indeed make no efforts to obtain it? Why? Because they don't care about it. To take up a profession is all they desire, but to proceed from one degree of piety to another, to grow in grace, to go on unto perfection is no part of their ambition. How many are there to whom, if we were to say, well, now you call yourself a Christian and wish others to consider you as such, and you are, of course, eagerly desirous of making continual advances in knowledge, faith, and holiness. And we shall see you evidently becoming more and more like Christ, who, I say, if we should thus address them, would look wonderingly in our face as if they did not comprehend our meaning, or reproachfully, as if we question their sincerity, or contemptuously, as if we were indulging in enthusiasm or mysticism, and wishing them to be as visionary as ourselves. Of course, such a frame of mind, and such views as these, are adverse to all progress. There must then be concern about the matter. And shall there be none? What? No solicitude to have more of the knowledge of truth, of faith in Christ, of likeness to God, of meetness for heaven. No desire to advance in such things. Is it possible to be a Christian and yet destitute of this? No, it is not. I tell you, it is not. If you have no concern to grow, there is no life in you. You are a piece of dead wood and not a living branch, a spiritual corpse and not a living man. In this state there can be no growth, for dead things never grow. While well, on the other hand, the very desire will ensure the possession of its object. Number two. You must enter deeply into that beatitude of the Lord which says, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, verse 6. This is a passage too much overlooked and forgotten by most professing Christians. Its terms are exceedingly strong. Its sentiment amazingly important. Among all the appetites of our animal nature, None is so strong, 
None so imperiously demands supply. None so constantly returns. None inflicts such suffering when not supplied as this of hunger and thirst. And this is the appetite which, in the figurative language of Scripture, is selected to express a vehement desire we should feel after righteousness or holiness. And it is not only one of our natural instincts of this kind, but both hunger and thirst that are spoken of. It is not the faint and feeble desire, which by one field almost to repletion is felt after some luxury, which if it be not obtained, a person can do very well without, oh, no, but the insatiable, unappeasable desire of the empty, hungry stomach after necessary food that is employed. Such would be the longing of every renewed soul after holiness. Righteousness should be to it that which bread is to the body. And in reference to which we should say, Evermore give us this bread. Instead of those longings after earthly blessings which characterize the worldly mind, those pantings after wealth, honor, and pleasure which excite such energies and call forth such activities, the mind of the believer should be intent on spiritual blessings. No measure of holiness to which he has already attained should satisfy him. There are sins yet to be mortified, and he must not be content till they are dead. There are heights of moral excellence above him which he has not reached, and he should long to climb up to them. What has he yet attained to? are but as crumbs to a hungry man who longs for the full meal, or drops of water to a thirsty one who pants for the copious draught. It is astonishing and affecting to see with what low degrees of righteousness some professors are satisfied. How little they seem to have of the spirit of holiness. How very little is there of forgetting the things that are behind and pressing forward to greater things yet. How many are there who are contented with the average piety of the church in the age, and seem only anxious to stand well in the estimation of their fellow Christians, who are no better than themselves? How few are there whom nothing can satisfy but an ever-growing conformity to the divine image? Perhaps there is in some persons a sad disposition to pervert, and abuse a passage of most instructive and encouraging and cautionary import. I mean the question which was asked concerning the small beginnings in the erection of the second temple at Jerusalem. Who has despised the day of small things? Zechariah 4 verse 10. This has been applied also in a spiritual way to the commencement of religion in the soul. We are told that little grace is better than none at all. The faith is still faith, though it be weak. Just as diamonds are diamonds and gold is gold, though it be in small pieces. Or to return to the idea already dwelt upon, life is life, though it be but that of a babe, and therefore it is not to be despised. We know it and admit it. But then if little things are not to be despised, ought great ones to be so treated? And is not satisfaction with little things when great ones may be obtained? to despise the latter? Be it so that fragments of gold and diamonds are not to be rejected, yet who is contented with the dust of either one when they might have ingots of the one or large and costly jewels of the other? No, the least measure of holiness is not to be despised. It contains a powerful principle of expansion and enlargement. Does a gardener despise the germ of the flower? or the seed of a plant, or the acorn of the oak? Or does a parent despise the day of small things and the life of his babe? No, but then neither the gardener nor the parent is satisfied with the day of small things, so neither should the Christian be. It is well, therefore, to consider, as Albert Barnes, the commentator, remarks, that there is no piety in the world which is not the result of cultivation, and which cannot be increased by the degree of care and attention bestowed upon it. 
No one becomes eminently pious any more than anyone becomes eminently rich or learned who does not intend it. And ordinarily men are, in religion, what they intend to be. They have about as much religion as they wish and possess about the characters which they design to possess. When men reach extraordinary elevations in religion, like Richard Baxter, Edward Payson, and Jonathan Edwards, they have gained only what they meant to gain, and a carefree and worldly professors of religion, who have little comfort and peace, have in fact the characters which they design to have. Number three, great attention to self-cultivation, spiritually considered, is a means of growth. By this I mean what is expressed in one or two passages of Scripture, such, for instance, as the exhortation, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23 It is the heart, the great vital spring of the soul, the fountain of actions, the center of principle, the seat of motives, the heart, where the thoughts and feelings out of which conduct comes. It is this that must be the first, chief, constant object of solicitude to the Christian. It is this which God sees, and as God sees it, and because God principally looks at it, that must be ever uppermost in our concern. To keep the heart must mean exerting ourselves with great earnestness and dependence upon divine grace. To preserve it in a good state, laboring to preserve its vitality, vigor, and purity, we must often ask the question, in what state is my heart? Are my thoughts and affections in a good spiritual condition? It is, in another view of it, the citadel of the soul. If this be neglected, the enemy at the gates will soon be in and take possession. Set a watch, therefore, upon the heart. Let the sentinel be never off duty, nor sleeping at his post. Keep out evil thoughts and unholy affections and vile imaginations. Without great vigilance, they will elude observation. As soon as an enemy of this kind is detected, he must be seized and made captive till every thought is brought into subjection to Christ. As the state of the heart is, so is a man in reality and before God. Discipline the heart, then. But there is a second passage well worth the attention of all young converts. I mean where Paul exhorts Timothy's thus, Exercise yourself unto godliness, First Timothy 4, 7. The word in the original is very strong. It might be rendered by a free translation, practice gymnastic exercises in religion, like the ancient competitors in the Olympic Games. We say also of soldiers in the early stage of their training, they are practicing their exercise. They are being trained in what they do not previously know and cannot perform without being taught. And to learn which and to do it well requires a great deal of labor. So it is with the Christian. He must in all that concerns true godliness learn his exercise and be often thus engaged. Religion and religious progress cannot be acquired without great pains. As a man cannot be at once a good soldier, while he is a young recruit, and before he has been drilled upon the parade ground, so no one can be an eminent Christian as soon as he is converted, and before he has been at his drilling. Self-improvement and knowledge by the student, and in business by the tradesman, are the result of great painstaking. No one can expect advancement without labor. It is astonishing and affecting to see how little anxiety there is among many, to improve themselves in religion. Number four. One great means of progress is a constant earnest and spiritual attendance upon all the appointed means of growth. Private prayer is essentially necessary. Thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, 
And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Matthew 6, verse 6. A spirit of prayer is so essential to personal religion that it may certainly be said that it is a dead soul in which there is not this spirit. As it may of the body, that it is a corpse in which there is no breath. Prayer is the most secret intercourse of the soul with God, the converse of one heart with another. Prayer requires retirement. A real Christian must be often alone with God. No one can make progress without much prayer. Religion is a plant that for growth must be often removed into the shade. It will be scorched and wither if it be always kept in the broad sunshine of publicity. It is a private intercourse of friends that increases their friendship. None can progress in love to God without this private communion. There must be time found and fixed for prayer, and a time fixed must be kept. That which is left to be done at any time is likely to be done at no time. There is nothing about which a young Christian should be more anxious than maintaining the spirit, the love, the practice of private prayer, and nothing which should more seriously alarm him than any disposition to neglect this. He who makes any excuse for omitting the appointed hour of visiting a friend must be in a fair way to lose all regard for him. But there are also public as well as private means to be observed. You must remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How necessary a right, though not a gloomy or superstitious observance of this day, is to the preservation and strengthening of our piety. It's attested by the experience of others, and not less so by our own. It is true it is a feast, and not a fast day, and should be kept in the spirit of the new and not of the old covenant, that is, with joy and freedom and not with gloom and bondage, still it must be serious joy. He who passes his Sabbath in frivolous conversation and levity of spirit, who is not devout in his attendance upon the means of grace, who does not make the best of the precious opportunity to improve his religious condition, who conducts himself much as on other days, except that he does not buy and sell, and goes once or twice to the house of God, cannot expect to get on in religion. Tell me how a professor spends his Sabbaths, and I will tell you in what state his soul is, spiritually considered. A Christian ought to be, and I am supposing he is, a communicant at the table of the Lord. If he is not, he ought to be. It is by way of eminence, the ordinance. Apart from any superstitious notion of it, it is a solemn and impressive solemnity. As creatures formed to be moved, as well as instructed, through the medium of the senses, we are likely to be affected by those symbols of the body and blood of Christ, which, with such awful though silent eloquence, speak to the ear of faith of him who is thus set forth crucified before us, Perhaps there is no ordinance of God which, when observed in a proper frame of mind, speaks so forcibly to our hearts and operates so powerfully upon our whole souls as this. There, believer, there renew your faith in the crucified Savior. There increase your love as you see His love so strikingly exhibited. And there, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable and well-pleasing to God. There, consecrate yourself afresh each time to his service as his faithful, devoted servant. What progress can you expect to make if you neglect this institute so expressly set up that through feeding by faith on the great sacrifice offered for you upon the cross, you might be strengthened with all might by the Spirit in the inner man? Connected with this is an attendance upon the solemnities of public worship. None who make any pretensions to religion can altogether neglect these. All such persons are there some part of the Sabbath, 
but it is not too obvious to be denied that modern habits of suburban residents in large towns are introducing a most injurious partial neglect of public worship. Once on the Sabbath day, and never in the week, is all the attendance some give at the house of God. Did the soul be strong and healthy upon such scanty fare as one meal a week? They who would grow in grace must love the habitation of God's house, must have the one desire of David to see God's power and glory in the sanctuary, must know something at least of what he felt when he says, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 42, 1 and 2. It is a man who loves the house of God who will put himself to some little inconvenience and will make some sacrifices of ease to be there, who is likely to profit by the appointed means. It is those that are planted in the courts of the Lord who shall flourish, and not those who are only occasionally there. And then how much depends upon the frame of mind in which and the purpose for which this attendance is carried on. There is a manner of attending upon the means of grace, which instead of benefiting the soul does it great harm. Gospel sermons and the richest devotional services may harden the heart instead of sanctifying it, and be a savor of death and a death instead of life and a life. Let us never forget that to be profited, that is to be spiritually improved in knowledge, Faith, holiness, joy, and love is the end of hearing sermons, and not merely to have our taste gratified by genius, eloquence, and oratory. I know scarcely anything of more importance to put before a young Christian than the necessity in order to a healthful state of religion, of a right end and object in hearing the word of God. We live in an age when talent is idolized and genius adored. This is the image of jealousy which makes jealous in the temple of the Lord. With too many it is not the truth of God that is thought of, valued, and delighted in, but the display of the talents of a man set forth. Now we admit that it is almost impossible not to admire and to be affected by genius. Mine must admire the nobler exhibitions of mind and cultivated intellects cannot put up with the crude effusions of ignorance or dullness. To such persons it is not only offensive to taste, but to piety, to hear such sublime and glorious themes as the gospel contains, set forth in the mean and tattered habiliments of vulgar language and mean thought. Who would like to have the richest delicacy served up on the meanest or broken earthen ware? Even in regard to books, elegant typography and good paper add to the pleasure of reading. Even where the manner is instructive and the subject of perusal is interesting. But it would argue an ill-regulated mind in the one case to be fonder of the elegance of the dish than of the good food which it contains. And in the other of the type, paper and binding of the book than of the momentous subject on which it treats. It is scarcely possible to give a more important piece of advice to one setting out on the ways of God than our Lord's words, take heed how you hear. We should hear sermons with something of the same state of mind, and for the same purpose as we should directions from a doctor concerning our health, or from a lawyer how to avert an impending sentence of death. Intimate converse with the word of God is essential to progress. We must neither neglect nor idolize the preacher. The sermon in the house of God must not displace the Bible from our hand. To be contented with the public ministry without the private searching of the Bible is virtually so far to turn papists, or at any rate to act like them. It is painful to think how little use multitudes make of their Bibles. It is a question which might bring a blush, or ought to do so, upon many a professor's cheek. How many chapters of God's holy word have you read in the last week or month? Not that the scripture should be merely read for the sake of being read. Some no doubt prescribe to themselves the task of reading so many chapters every day, and perhaps with much the same motive as the papist repeats his Ave Marias or his Paternosters as a kind of penance. This is not what we mean. 
And we would at once suggest that as in eating it is not the quantity of food taken into the stomach, but the quantity that can be digested which keeps up our strength and promotes our health. So it is not the quantity of scripture read, but the quantity studied, understood and applied it does us good. One first pondered upon, felt, applied, is better than a whole chapter or book read negligently, thoughtlessly, and without self-application. Not that a verse a day is enough spiritual food for anyone. It may be feared that not a few have abused those little manuals of piety got up for the edifications of persons who really can not command time for much reading. I mean those text-a-day books which are now so common. Surely they who can command time should hardly be satisfied with such a crumb of the bread of life as this. A real devout and intelligent study of the scriptures then is essential to great progress in the life of God. Man lives not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. To every young convert, therefore, we say, search the scriptures daily. Meditate on the law of God day and night. Try how much of the word of God you can understand. And what is more, try how much you can practice. Study the word of God with prayer for divine teaching. Take up David's petition, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Remember this also. There is much corruption in your heart, generating a false bias and beclouding your judgment, and likely therefore to lead you to misconception and error. Beseech of God to send forth His Spirit into your heart to purify it from depravity, that your understanding may be better preserved from error. Enter deeply into the meaning and spirit of that remarkable saying of our Lord, If any man will do his, God's, will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. John seven seventeen. In this important passage we are taught that the disposition of the heart has much to do with the views and opinions of the intellect. In all moral questions it must be so. A sincere wish and purpose to do the will of God will be our best way to know the mind of God. An honest heart is the most likely means to gain a correct judgment. True it is that we must in some degree know the mind of God in order to do His will. But a desire to do His will is also the way to know it more perfectly. We must have knowledge to produce holiness. But holiness will prepare us for more knowledge. And the knowledge we acquire in this way will be of a spiritual and experimental kind. We must give up all preconceived ideas, all prejudices, all pride of intellect, and go in humility to the scriptures as learners. Occasional seasons of extraordinary devotion, self-examination, and humiliation will be found eminently conducive to progress. I am, of course, supposing for I have already prescribed it, that a regular course of private prayer is kept up. But we all know that regularity is apt to degenerate into formality, and what is customary into mere routine. There may be the most exact order and the most constant observance of religious exercises, and yet there may be nothing better than a dull round of observances. Hence it is indispensable that there should be occasional seasons of unusual devotion, when the soul shall take exact account as it can of its state and condition. What has been already said on the subject of an excessive anxiety about our growth, leading to almost a neglect of the means of progress, and an inquiry into the reality of progress should be borne in mind, but still occasional examination into the state of our profession cannot be wrong. It must be right. A nervous person always fearful about his health, and ever inquisitive into symptoms and pouring into books to see how ill he is, instead of using all the means of obtaining and preserving health, is not very likely ever to be well, yet sometimes, provided it does not occur too often, or hinder him from present duties, he may inquire whether some chronic complaints are giving way, and whether his constitution is strengthening. We surely ought not to be less anxious about our soul's health, than we are about of our body, 
and throw a religious nervousness about their soul, which really does distress some good people, should not be fostered, still an occasional examination into our spiritual condition ought to be instituted, and is really essential to progress. I do not see how we are to know what corruptions exist and are to be mortified, or what graces languish and need to be revived without occasional more minute inspection than we give to the subject in our ordinary conduct. In this age when secular manners are so pressing, I may say so engrossing and absorbing, when business so encroaches on devotion, and a time formerly given to the closet is taken away to be given to the shop, when all men are living in a hurry, and life itself is one constant bustle, surely, I say, at such a time as this, it is necessary sometimes to step out of the circle and to enter the closet for pressing home upon the conscience the momentous question, how am I going on in my heavenly course? Such seasons may be found, and if it can be at no other time and in no other way, it is worthwhile to give up occasionally a sermon and to spend the hour or two which would be otherwise devoted to that exercise in solitary communion with our own heart, with our Bible, and with our God. A reading from Christian Progress by John Angel James.